almost any weekend, clouds of smoke can be seen rising from a park or parking lot somewhere in the United States in what has become an American tradition, the barbecue cook-off. Competitors haul in all manner of cooking contraptions from simple smokers to custom-built steel behemoths that look like Jules Verne had a hand in designing them. Eye-catching team names and equipment, along with a laid-back party atmosphere, help draw in the public. The reward? The smells and taste thrills of real barbecue. There's something primal about barbecue. When you smell that smoke, and then you get a bite of that meat, it just it hits a primal button in you. Despite the fun and good food, cook-offs are serious business to the competitors. Recently, the Autry Museum of the American West in Los Angeles held its first annual cook-off. And there was more at stake than just prize money. Los Angeles is just now getting into the uh, market or the venue of uh, barbecue cook-offs. You have all the big-name competitors out here today. They all want to win because we all want to be able to walk away and say we were the first winner of the Autry cook-off. Each team brings the size and shape of equipment it feels will turn out the most savory, lip-smacking product possible. This is uh, what I consider an L-shaped smoker. There's a firebox down here, and um, there's four chambers. The reason I like this is because I get a great variance of temperature from over here at 300 degrees down to over here at 150 degrees, so I can control the amount of time I cook certain meats. This is a barbecue that's not unusual in its design or concept. It's out there on the market. What we did is taken and, and added all the stainless and diamond plate and you know, carved flames into the stacks. By the way, that some truckers can be really pissed off someday when he wakes up and finds his stacks gone, but that's another story. Today I'm cooking on the uh, Weber Smoky Mountain, which is a retail piece of equipment that's available to the homeowner, and it's something that we use a lot in uh, the barbecue circuit. When it comes to the judging, the judging's blind, so the judges don't know whether it come off the $200 pit or the $20,000 pit. They bring their entries in. We actually change the numbers, so there's no chance that the judges will know whose entry they're judging. And they judge that on appearance, taste, and tenderness. Not all cook-offs are run the same. In South Carolina, the tradition is to cook whole hogs, which can take up to 20 hours or more. To keep things fair, the hogs are supplied to the contestants the day the cook-off begins, so no preparations can be made in advance. Well, thank you, sir. All right. Cooking whole hog really separates the men from the boys. It is tough. Anybody can cook some ribs, even I can cook ribs, but it takes an artist to cook whole hog. Many contestants come armed with units custom-built to tackle the task of cooking a really big pig. They've also got a practical knowledge of physics. How this thing works is it's fired from the bottom, and we burn wood. We burn either peach or wild cherry. It's an indirect cooker, meaning the flames come up, hit the bottom of the water pan, heat the water up so you've got a mild, moist, gentle steam rising from the bottom. Then you've got the dry heat that comes up around the sides of the pig and then drafts back out the top. And what that does, it rolls inside. So you've got dry heat meeting moist heat. So therefore, you've got a, a natural convection. It gives you a real mild, real tender, very, very, very smoky flavor to your meat. To the diehards on the cook-off circuit, the term barbecue is often misused by the general public. One of the most important things for people to understand is the difference between barbecuing and grilling. And there is a big difference. With grilling, you're cooking hot and fast, searing the meat over the direct influence of the flame, and you're cooking at temperatures of 400 plus degrees. Now, barbecuing is the exact opposite. You're cooking low and slow, 180 to 225 degrees, indirectly away from the flame and away from the heat source. The origins of this low and slow culinary art have been obscured in a smoky mixture of history and folklore. But I always heard that over in China, a house burnt down, I'm probably wrong, and had some pigs in it. <laughs> and so they still went to tasting it, and that's how barbecue came around. That might just be an old fairy tale, but I'm telling you what I heard. <laughs> 
Through the ages, everyone from cavemen to the kings of England has enjoyed a feast of wild game or livestock cooked over an open flame. But we can't really be sure if their cooking techniques qualified as barbecue. There's a greater degree of certainty, however, about the origin of the word itself. When the Spanish were exploring the New World, they came across the native people of the West Indies cooking their meats over a smoky fire on a rack made of green saplings called a barbacot. The Spaniards came to call it barbacoa. Still, the smoked flavor wasn't so much the aim of the process as an accidental byproduct. The real purpose of the technique was to preserve the meat and simply keep the flies away. From here, the history of barbecue in North America splinters according to region. The Carolinas tradition of cooking whole hog originates with their earliest settlements. The pig is not indigenous to, uh, to the Western Hemisphere, to the Americas. And so the Europeans, the Spaniards, brought the pig with them. And the first colony, the first colony of any European nation was in South Carolina. And there, their Indian friends were, the Native Americans. They are the people who actually had learned how to cook with gradation of heat. In the Southwest, barbecue evolved on the frontier cattle drives, where cowboys rode the range with a beef dinner walking right next to them. Today, Southwest barbecue is still identified with the cowboy mystique. The decor in restaurants like the County Line in Houston, Texas, reflects the region's Western heritage. But as far as the food is concerned, cowboys never enjoyed meat barbecued in large wood-burning smokers with a heavy-duty rotisserie system. This is the heart of the restaurant, this, the, the smoker's uh, orsicle pits. And uh, you got a chain driven by a very slow speed but very high torque motor and it needs to be high torque. It's got to have a lot of strength. You're going to end up with 160 racks of baby racks in there, perhaps uh, 50 briskets. You're talking about maybe 1,000 pounds of meat. Then this pit is huge. It's a big piece of space in there. So you got to do the whole thing, cooking through it back and forth, up and down on it. And that's what the chain and the rotisserie system achieve for us. The cooking heat is determined by the amount of wood burning and a temperature control that operates dampers to adjust airflow as needed. 175 is our cold smoking temperature. 225 is more of the, the finishing it up. So it's nice and hot uh, for you to eat. During the heyday of the 19th century Texas cattle drives, the final destination for many of the herds was Kansas City. Since the early 20th century, Kansas City and barbecue have been almost synonymous. It didn't originate there, but it was where all the crucial elements came together. Kansas City became a barbecue mecca because, well, first of all, we had people with barbecue knowledge who migrated primarily from southern states. We also had lots of hickory and oak nearby. We also had the meat because we had a huge stockyards. That's the combination you need. It's been a great marriage. Back then, barbecue was considered poor people's food because the process made even the cheapest, toughest cut of meat more edible. Back in the 20s, was, I mean, they even had wild animals. They was barbecuing coon, possum, or meat they discard from the packing house that the mainstream people didn't want. That's how it started here, Kansas City Barbecue. Gone are the days when barbecue's main purpose was to salvage unappetizing meat. Today, many aficionados make a pilgrimage to this Kansas City restaurant, Arthur Bryant's. Here, they can truly sink their teeth into the city's early barbecue heritage. In the early 50s, Mr. Bryant relocated to here, 17th in Brooklyn. And this used to be an old bakery. This used to be the oven. And Mr. Bryant converted the oven into a pit. That's why you need a good pit man, because his temperature in this pit can get up to 500 degrees. But we try to keep our temperature between 150 and 300 in the process of cooking our briskets and ribs. Thank you, sir. 
Greater Kansas City boasts more than 90 barbecue restaurants. Some have gone upscale, while others are decidedly down home. Backyard grilling and barbecuing didn't become a great American pastime until shortly after World War II, when GIs returned home and settled into suburbia. One of them, George Stephen, was destined to help lead the way. My father, like a lot of Americans coming back from World War II, was basically cooking on a brick structure just like this. And uh, it would flare up, he couldn't control anything, so he never was, was very satisfied with the way that worked, which got him thinking about he could do something better. That led him to inventing the original Weber kettle right here. Where the invention really lies with this is in the fact that putting the lid on really affected the way the heat was used in the barbecue and made it more efficient. And by putting dampers in it, he could control the amount of air going through the barbecue so he could control the heat and the flare-up and, and the, the cooking process itself. George Stephen worked for the Weber Brothers Metalworks. And together, they made the kettle a big success. It's gone through some variations and refinements over the years and is now manufactured in an enormous facility in Huntley, Illinois. This is the only factory in the world that makes the Weber charcoal grill. Uh, and behind me, there is machinery making the different size charcoal grills that we manufacture. We have 200 ton to 500 ton presses to press the different shapes of the bowls and lids. On the opposite side of the room are other presses that make the attaching parts for the grills themselves. The way the, uh, the classic kettle is made, or any kettle is made, we put a steel blank in a drawing compound, which was like a soap material, uh, to prevent the metal from wrinkling or cracking. What happens then is the press closes and then a ram comes down through to actually form the shape. From there, the kettles move on to another press to have air holes punched and excess steel removed. After parts are attached, the kettles are hung on a conveyor system. First, they pass through a washer to remove the soap compound and any oil and residues so they can be coated with a porcelain enamel finish. They go into our furnace where they're fired at 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. That gives them the durability and the shiny surface that you see on all Weber products. The coating on each kettle is quality checked in a room with lighting approximating daylight. Next, in the packaging area, handles, and dampers are attached to the kettles, which then are packaged with all the other necessary parts for shipment to destinations around the world. After more than 50 years, the Weber kettle is still a big seller in what has become a very competitive marketplace, exploding with alternative designs and endless new options to choose from. The one burning question facing every backyard chef is which fuel to choose. Will it pour from a bag? Or come hissing out of a tank? The original and the most basic barbecue fuel is wood, especially if the goal is to add a real smoked flavor. But logs, along with the jumbo equipment to burn them, aren't always practical for the home barbecuer. One alternative is the wood pellet. The Traeger pellet mill in Mount Angel, Oregon, begins its production process with sawdust from local furniture manufacturers. The material is brought in from the top here, comes down, goes through what we call a conditioner that blends it together, and it comes down and is dropped down into the die. And we'll go ahead and open the door here so you can take a look. And as you can see, the material comes out here 
and drops down and goes in the center of the die. Inside the die, there's two rolls. This die turns, and the rolls force the material out through the die. This die gets up to about 400 degrees, and there's lignans that are in the wood, and the lignans turn to a liquid. It's like a glue. So when they come out, these pellets are about 400 degrees, and they're kind of soft. But the lignin, the glue, is what keeps them together. After being extruded and cut into pellets, the material is carried off on a conveyor to be cooled and bagged. A few miles away, in a 100-year-old former dairy building, Traeger Industries also produces its own line of grills. Inside each of them is an electrically powered system developed to efficiently burn pellets. The first component on it is a one and a half RPM motor that drives the auger, which feeds the pellets from the hopper down to the fire pot. On the bottom of the fire pot, there's an igniter. When the burner is turned on, the element heats up and then catches the pellets on fire. One pound of pellets outputs 8,500 BTUs and can last up to an hour or more. The ability to add more pellets to the hopper as needed makes this an efficient way to maintain consistent heat over the long process of real barbecue. A more traditional way to cook barbecue is with charcoal. Charcoal is produced by burning wood until water vapor and other materials are removed, reducing the wood to almost pure carbon. Workers outside of Jackie Heights restaurant in Leesville, South Carolina, use a firebox to produce a steady supply of coals. The firebox feeds heat to the restaurant's pits for the entire time the hogs are being cooked. This is the way you burn down real wood to get charcoal to put in your pits. It's real charcoal. It's not imitation. Workers carry shovel loads into the pits as needed to maintain the temperature. They're spread around the edges to create indirect heat. The cooking temperature is kept so low that cardboard can be used to cover the pits. You couldn't use cardboard if you get them any hotter than we do. We fire these hogs. In the wintertime, we have to go every 20 or 25 minutes. In the summer, you live every 30 minutes if you put the right amount of coal to your shovel. While Jackie Height prefers to burn down his own coals, most of us let others do the hard work and buy them in a bag. When mass-produced for commercial distribution, charcoal made from 100% wood is called lump. But for about 80 years, briquettes have been the most popular way to cook over coals, thanks to automaker Henry Ford. It started back in 1922. Henry Ford uh, was the originator. He was looking for something to do with the excess wood he had from making the Model T. Ford learned that he could take this excess wood and make briquettes out of it. The original plant was designed by two prominent people, E.G. Kingsford, who is a relative of Henry Ford and who the brand is named after today, and Thomas Edison. Today, the Kingsford company uses more than a million tons of waste wood each year. One of their plants, located in Springfield, Oregon, receives several daily truckloads of waste from local lumber mills. Each truck's entire trailer is lifted until its contents are poured out and added to the enormous wood pile. After the product is dumped, we have a bulldozer where what we do is uh, make it into a consistent pile. Since we get it from different mills in the area, the wood can be a slightly different from mill to mill. This is what the material looks like. Uh, as we get it in from the trucks and you can see the particle size in it. It also it does have quite a bit of moisture to it. And we put this on the pile and age it for approximately six to eight weeks. It's very similar to what you might have at home as a compost pile. This material is actually being seasoned in the pile and so it does give off some heat so you'll see some steam coming up off of the pile. A bulldozer is also used to push the aged material into a hopper that feeds a conveyor belt. From here, it's a quick ride up to a shaker screen that sizes the material. The pieces that are small enough fall through holes in the screen. 
while the oversized pieces which fall off the end of the screen are ground down to the right size and added back to the process. Next, the still damp material is fed into a dryer. And what this is is very similar to what your clothes dryer might be at home. We're actually putting the wet material, the wet wood material is in feeding on, the, on this side of the dryer where it starts out at 60% moisture and ends up at the end of the process at five to 7% moisture. Then the dried material is fed into the top of a large kiln-like chamber called a retort. As the wood material travels from top to bottom, it's exposed to temperatures that surpass 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. On each level, four slowly rotating rabble arms act as rakes to make sure the material burns evenly and to push it on to the next level. By the time it reaches the bottom, the wood has been converted into char. The char is then mixed with coal, other ingredients, and binders to hold the mixture together. At this point, the material has the consistency of a moist potting soil. What is occurring here is the mixture, the char and the coal mixture that we're feeding together is actually feeding down in between these two press rolls. This facility makes over 3.8 billion briquettes a year through these presses. After the briquettes are pressed, they travel over another shaker that eliminates any that are broken. Then it's on to the final drying process. The two dryers that you see on either side of you stretch 120 feet long. A briquette starts at 26% moisture. It takes an hour and 40 minutes to go from one end of the dryer to the other end of the dryer where it exits at 5% moisture. These briquettes that we produce can be packaged at the end of this time uh, directly into a bag. At Kingsford Springfield plant, more than 110,000 tons of briquettes are bagged each year. The barbecue purist may see the briquette as a compromise to convenience, but an even greater compromise to even more convenience is gas. For the last few years, gas grill sales have outpaced charcoal grills. Fueled by a propane tank or a connection to a natural gas line, these grills are ready to cook in a very short time and their temperatures can be controlled with a turn of a knob. Multiple gas burners allow backyard chefs to cook at different temperatures at the same time. To avoid the flare-ups that often plague gas grills, many create a more indirect heat with a layer of ceramic briquettes or tiles that separates the flames from the food. One technological step beyond gas burners are infrared elements. Thermal Engineering Corporation, or TEC, in Columbia, South Carolina, originally developed infrared for applications like paint drying. TEC first adapted infrared for cooking in the 1980s. Now they're manufacturing grills featuring a newly designed infrared emitter. Beneath the grill rack is a plate of tempered glass that lies over a perforated metal plate designed to emit a mixture of gas and air evenly over its surface. When ignited, the glass plate blocks the flow of hot air so that the food isn't cooked by convection, but rather molecular excitation. Infrared is a form of electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths longer than visible light, but shorter than microwaves. These apertures are heated up to about 1650 or 1700 degrees, and then we use glass on top of this as a secondary emitter. The family of wavelengths coming directly off of this burner is shorter, and once they go through the glass or re-radiated by the glass, they become longer in, in the electromagnetic spectrum. And what, what our studies have shown is that if we use long wavelength radiation, we, we have less moisture loss and less shrinkage to the food. But when it comes to barbecue, whether cooking with high-tech infrared or low-tech coals, Heat and meat are only half the story. For many, the other half is all about sauce, sauce, and more sauce.
barbecue is about flavors, adding mouth-watering and savory tastes, using a rub as the hands-on way to spice things up. But the wet and sometimes wild way most of us do it is with a generous slathering of sauce. The majority of sauces are sweet and tomato-based, but in the Carolinas, mustard and vinegar are the key ingredients. The southwestern approach is to turn up the heat with chili powder and peppers that range from searing jalapenos to hellishly hot habaneros. Well, over the years, they've added a vast array of sauces. There's many different types of raspberry sauces, chipotle sauces, vinegar-based sauces, um, leading to the names of whoop-ass, uh, Gates, John Henry's. John Henry's first hit the shelves in 1996. And despite its growing nationwide distribution, it's still a small family-run operation in Houston, Texas. We started out with one gallon of barbecue sauce with one customer. We took care of that one customer, made sure that one customer was always happy. We're around now, oh gosh, a thousand gallons of barbecue sauce, you know, a year. John Henry sauces are made in a cramped kitchen, 40 gallons at a time, in a double-jacketed steam kettle. The main advantage of using this piece of equipment is that it protects its contents from scorching. A gas flame is used to heat water enclosed in a chamber beneath the kettle, which makes steam that circulates in the space between the kettle and the outer jacket, creating an even heat, perfect for cooking up a sauce. To begin one of our sauces, we start with, of course, water, and then we start with the base of the sauce, which is called a slurry. And that is to give the sauce flavor, give it fullness, and to add more texture to the sauce. And ours has a perfect balance of, uh, of uh, sweet and spices, and uh, there's, there's, some, there's some spices going in now. And uh, my goodness, that looks good. You want to look at that? Let's just take a shot at that, will you? Yeah, that's what it started looking like now. This is a concoction of three ingredients that we put in to uh, balance out the uh, sugar. And you want to make sure that the pH is right. And then once you figure out what that pH, what, what the acid and the sugar balance is, that's the whole secret right there. Don't count on John Henry to disclose his ingredients, which are inspired by a love of barbecue passed down for generations. But he is willing to share some of his process. This is a beater or an agitator. And what you want to do here, you want to incorporate the slurry and all the other ingredients, the spices, uh, into the uh, uh, tomato product that we just put in. So what we want to do, we want to go all the way down to the bottom. And once you go down to the bottom, you can see, see how thick it is. It's already good thick. After all the ingredients are incorporated in the sauce and it's cooked for an average of two hours, it's bottled in the unautomated assembly line, that same cramped kitchen. We started out with a mason jar because that's what we could afford back when we started. We never got away from this. People have wanted to try to put it in a fancy jar, but we, we sort of balk at that. We want to stay with basic. Get through with the sauce, you can make this a water jar, you know? <laughs> Original One in Kansas City, Kansas, also manufactures its own sauces. But as the supply of ingredients in their warehouse indicates, on a much larger scale, they also serve as a food processing plant for many other brands that don't want to invest the time and equipment to produce their product themselves. For our first time customers, they come out here to the 80 gallon kettles. We work with them that day, they're in here with us. We perfect their sauce in the 80-gallon kettles. Once they determine that they like what we're doing, they're ready to move on to the bigger kettles. We bring them over to either a 200-gallon kettle or a 250-gallon kettle or the Big Daddy 300-gallon kettle. 300-gallon kettle will produce about 2,200 units in a 16-ounce bottle. After Original One's brewers mix the ingredients together for a particular sauce, they perform a thickness test. For this particular recipe, the customer wants to have a thickness of about 18. So I'm using a costometer that has a, a bubble in it, and you make it a level fill for the sauce. We're going to pour the sauce in. 
We're gonna do about a 15 second count when we open the gate. Okay, right now we're at a 15 and a half, so that means I need to add a little water to it to get the sauce where the customer wants it in his bottle. Once the sauce makers achieve the desired thickness, they bring the temperature up to 190 degrees to sterilize the product. Then it's time to attach a hose to the kettle and pump the sauce over to the bottling assembly line. We fill our bottles hot at 190 to 195. We want to pull a vacuum to make sure that we get a seal on the jar. It runs down the line, then it gets a stamp date for a Best Buy date, then it goes through a bander to put a safety seal on it, goes through a heat tunnel to shrink that on there, then it goes through the labeling system, into the box, right out the door. Developing a recipe for a new sauce is one big challenge. Getting the public to buy it for the first time is another. I have found that labeling is an interesting thing. You have to have a label that stands out with bright colors or a unique, um, something unique about it for people to pull it off the shelf. And that's why we have come up with the Paint is Good line. It is an outstanding label to work with. Luckily for consumers, most sauces the pack of wallop give fair warning. Others are sweetly seductive. But addictive new tastes aren't the only things tempting barbecue lovers. So are sparkling new toys to tinker with. Barbecuing has gone beyond just outdoor cooking. It has become a lifestyle, and in some cases, an obsession. Top of the line grills have become status symbols. Elaborate outdoor cooking islands can have all the conveniences of an indoor kitchen. Where the climate permits, outside has become far more comfortable than inside. Then there's the setting. Dr. David Biedebaugh has created a backyard that can serve up the pre-dinner entertainment while the meal is prepared on an extravagant cooking island. When we moved in here, nothing was done to the backyard, and we wanted to put an outdoor kitchen in so that we could enjoy the view and be cozy by a fireplace and put a plasma TV in, and then a 24-foot barbecue. We put in Viking refrigerator, Viking ice maker, and a warming drawer. Now, this is important because you can put your plates in here until you're ready to serve. Then we've got a double side burner. You can a hot plate, or you can uh, create your sauces. You move over here into a 53-inch Viking grill, several burners, rotisserie with double, in, double infrared, as well as a true sear burner. Now, that has a low and a high getting up to 1,200 degrees, which sears in the juices very quickly, and you can move it over to cook slower. Or you can close the hood and make an oven out of it, take it up to 450, 600 degrees, whatever you like. Over here, we've got the wok cooker, and it goes up to 32,500 BTUs, which is important for Asian food. This is a refreshment center. You put the ice in here, which you get from the ice maker, and you have your hard liquor, your condiments, and your ever-popular kegerator for a little party beer. Barbecue has become a gadget lover's paradise, and Dr. Bidaba is always on the lookout for something new. I like gadgets. I'm a consummate consumer. Here is tongs that for late night cooking, I just push the button here, the LED light comes on, and I can see what I'm aiming at. It's beautiful. Barbecue stores are spreading like wildfire. Their shelves are crowded with specialized cooking aids and feature everything from tumble baskets to chicken thrones. Those eager to literally fill their meat with flavor can get to the point with syringe-like injectors. If you're cooking something bigger than a chicken, there's an injector to fill the bill, or in this case, the hog. And that's what we have here. We're going to inject the hog with uh, a secret sauce. And uh, what that does is kind of tenderizes the meat a little bit. We're going to inject it and let it sit for a couple hours before we actually put the heat to it. Meat thermometers monitor internal temperatures during cooking. 
This meat fork doubles as a digital thermometer. One of the tines is the heat sensor. Too busy to mind your meat? How about a digital thermometer that transmits a signal to a unit you can wear on your belt? Your food is ready. And if you're in the mood for barbecue but want to leave the work to others, all you need is a phone or a computer. After building a successful restaurant business, Jack Stack of Kansas City decided to get into the mail order barbecue business. My thought process when I decided on this shipping thing, it's kind of like, let's just get this going. Let's just find us a little space. And of course, I found out that, you know, all the meat has to be cooked in federally inspected plants. They can't come out of your restaurant. And that was a curveball that we got through. Jack Stack found a USDA certified facility where all the food preparation can be supervised by the restaurant's pit master. What we're doing today is cooking barbecue ribs. This oven here holds approximately 300 ribs at a time that allows us to almost duplicate our open wood cookery that we use in our restaurants every day. By using this machine, we can control how much smoke we put on the product and also allows us to control the temperature of the product as we're cooking it. After the ribs have cooked for six to eight hours, they're ready to cool off. Once they go in the cooler, they're cooled down to about 38 degrees. From that point, we immediately pull them out and take them over to the vacuum machine where we vacuum pack them to seal in the freshness. The vacuum sealed product is trucked across town to Jack Stack's cold storage and fulfillment facility. Renting space in an underground industrial park constructed in a former limestone mine has its advantages. It's temperature controlled year round, security year round. It's uh, an ambiance of 63 degrees. It never changes. It makes it easier for our freezers to keep the product frozen at a certain temperature. When we're pulling the orders, the product stays colder longer. We'll put the ribs, beans, or whatever barbecue item the customer's ordered in a styrofoam reusable container, along with a cardboard box to keep it from being damaged through shipment. We'll then put a piece of thermal foil over the product. Uh, we'll put dry ice on there, which is 150 degree below zero. It'll go to the customers through FedEx, and they get it and enjoy it. Mail order barbecue can now make it to your table in about the same time it takes to slow cook a large cut of meat in true barbecue fashion. For one man, though, it's not just eating and cooking barbecue that's important. The art is in the pit. He's created some of the most outrageous ever. For those in the market for a truly unique barbecue, a visit to David Close's workshop in Houston, Texas, shows why he's gained fame for his handcrafted creations. This is what we commonly refer to as bling bling. The public named it. It's got 24 karat gold mags, gold handles. It's also uh, holds about 600 pounds of meat. Over here we have satellite TV, which gets a thousand channels, and it's all solar powered. So it operates off of 2,000 amp cranking the staggered marine batteries. Now the paint job on this pit is a 100 year Ferrari metal flake burgundy with clear coat. What's interesting is when we put the clear coat on it, it candied it a little bit. Patent leather stools gives you something to sit on. And if you have a shelving, which is actually the fenders, then you've got gold plated faucets and three sinks. You have 30 gallon water tanks underneath and holding tanks. A spare tire on the front and then the gas injection for the firebox as well as the fish fryer burners, and you've got a complete package. David founded Barbecue Pits by Close in 1986. He manufactures several styles of professional and consumer pits, all built by hand, in the spirit of old style iron foundries. This is one of the composite pits that we built. It's actually two separate pits built in the same line. It's uh, probably about 12 feet long. It's got dual pull-out shells slide out trays, upright slow smoker, and a unique steak grill that hand cranks to any cooling height that you want. All you have to do is lock it and walk away and it won't continue to cook, it'll keep it warm. David may have constructed some of the best barbecues ever built, 
and he certainly constructed some of the oddest. We have the distinction of building the world's largest pit in the world. It was 80 foot long and probably do about 15,000 pounds of meat. This is the world's smallest barbecue pit. It's fired with one pecan in the firebox and then just big enough to put one Vienna sausage inside. I'm always looking for stuff to make into a new pit. We found this out in the country. It was crushed, so we straightened it out over a month period, and it turned out to be a baby carriage. Uh, later on, we found out it was a 1906 baby carriage from London, so it shows that there's nothing safe from a welder's touch. Some of the things we made were foam booths, beer bottle pits. Just recently, a couple weeks ago, a friend of mine gave us a 1938 mailbox. It was completely rusted. It was amazing. With a little bit of paint, add some shelving inside, and you've got a natural blown Texas smoker. One of David's most meticulously constructed cookers was commissioned for the Continental Airlines barbecue team. It's an exact one-tenth scale replica of a 777 wide-body jet. We went to David because he was the most renowned barbecue builder and pit builder in Houston and sat down and started the initial drawings and everything with him. And as you can see, he did a wonderful job for us. What we find is people don't realize what it is because they pull up and we've got an airplane inside of a trailer. And then we raise up the doors and people begin to realize that it's a functional barbecue pit. And the doors are raised and lowered through a series of cables and pulleys. When we're cooking, we have the fire up to temperature, we close the doors, and the smoke travels through the fuselage and exits up through the tail on the top of the trailer. While David gets a kick out of taking barbecue into the 21st century, he's also a proud Texan. Rolling out his chuck wagon rig takes him back in history. Despite all the crazy contraptions we build, at the end of the day, we like to go out and take a model out and celebrate our Western heritage. And we like to keep that spirit alive in the community of America. Barbecue really has become America's cuisine. Whether you spend way under $100 or hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment, it all comes down to a matter of taste. Barbecue is whatever you want it to be, whatever you want it to taste like. The two basic components that I would say uh, will render out good barbecue is patience and have fun. Because if you're rushing it, then you're not going to have the love that's going to emulate from the meat. After all, what word other than barbecue is not only a verb, but a noun for a kind of cooking device, a cuisine, and an event that promises a good time as well as good food.